Uh, so for those of you who might have been here on Tuesday, this is the same slide deck with a completely different uh, narrative. Um, for those maybe that, that don't, don't know me or my, my history, I started my career in the aerospace industry and uh, worked, um, worked on payloads that were deployed by the, the Canada arm on the space shuttle. That was sort of the first uh, things that I did. I'm Canadian, by the way, so if you can't understand me, I apologize. Um, I've worked for Marconi uh, in cockpit avionics for a number of years. I worked in the telecom sector uh, for, uh, for Newbridge Networks uh, for a number of years. And then I started a semiconductor company, uh, which was a lot of fun. High volume production SOCs are challenging. Um, had an interesting uh, experience with, uh, with that company called Tundra Semiconductor. Uh, we had a nice IPO, which was fun. Everyone should have at least uh, the experience of managing a publicly traded company at some point in their life. It's a whole different set of challenges. And then as my kids were finishing high school, I wanted to hang out with them and be Mr. Dad for a while, checked out for a little bit, and actually never went back to work for a, a company again and was spent really the last uh, 10 to 15 years of my life uh, working with different technology companies uh, in, a con in a consultancy kind of fashion and VCs and technology enablement uh, roles. And five years ago with Kirsta and Dave, I started the RISC-V Foundation, uh, which you know, proved to be a pretty interesting project. So before going any further uh, into, the, into the talk, um, I expect that the hands will go down with the successive questions that are going to ask. So by show of hands, who in the room has either used, committed, or contributed to any type of open source project? I'm sure everybody's hand will go up. Great. Everybody look around. All the hands are up. Leave your hand up. Hold on. Leave your hand up. Everybody, all the hands are up. Great. Who then of this, these projects have worked on open source IP for silicon? Some of the hands are going down. Some of the hands are, okay. Who then have sent to high volume SOC, or high volume production, sorry, that IP? Nobody. That's the problem. So we are going to talk about adoption, open source IP adoption in the semiconductor industry. What are the barriers? And why the hell can't we figure out how to make this work? Clearly, there's a lot of business motivations that are, you know, maybe, maybe stopping us. Um, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of complicated IP in the whole stack, if you will. And um, the, the context of this discussion and the context of the Open Hardware Group is an attempt to collect the right commercial interests, academic interests, individual contributor open source enthusiast interests in such a fashion that we can actually break through these barriers finally. You know, we have, as, as sailors on the rocky seas, right, we have been attracted by the, the siren song of open source and the promise of open source. And we've looked across the hall at our software brother and an open source software development and, oh, geez, yeah, well, it should be easy, right? Well, obviously, it's not been. So that, that's, that's the context for the discussion. And for those of you who do know me a little bit, I'm not a very formal individual. We can do questions along the way. I actually prefer it that way. So at any point in time, please interrupt me um, and, and ask me a question. So I'm going to skip through a couple of slides of what this is. We made an announcement last week on Thursday of the Open Hardware Group. And I'm gonna just give you a quick overview of what it is, what we're doing, what we're trying to do, and then talk about the details of what the barriers are. At least I think I am. I will. Oh, that could be it. I'll use this. That'll work. So, Open Hardware Group is sort of what it sounds like. Uh, an organization that is driven by members to address uh, and the availability of high performance cores, processor cores, for use in high volume SOCs. 
And in particular, the first part of the family is a series of open source RISC V cores called Core 5 that are based on the good work that has happened here at ETH Zurich. So Luca and Frank and Devada and the team, the pulp platform team, the first two cores that are being contributed to this, contributed to this family are the RISC-E core and the Ariana core. So what is going to happen uh, as, we, as we get ramp the organization up is those repositories are going to graduate, if you will, and, and grow up and graduate and leave university, move into industry, and those open source repositories will be managed by this group. We have good partners, um, and, and, and the intent is that this is a, going to be an international organization with a global footprint. So we have good strategic partners. We're a member of the RISC-V Foundation. We're working strategically with the Eclipse Foundation and following the process that they've used for years to release uh, new, new instances of the Eclipse IDE. Obviously, we, we love the, the, the Fozzie guys. We have good legal and accounting and banking support, which is great. This is probably more important. We have good corporate sponsorship. Um, Software adoption and Linux, dis Linux distributions in the server space happened because commercial companies cared about it. And until and when we have enough commercial companies that care about um, uh, the, the open hardware IP that we're trying to uh, get adopted, we'll, we'll have those same issues. So with right now we have 13 sponsor companies, more are coming. This is how many we had as of the announcement. So commercial, import, commercial support is, in my experience, absolutely critical for open source adoption. The board of directors is pretty well represented. Um, Rob Oshana from NXP is, is our chairman. Uh, we have uh, Alessandro Picavati from Silicon Labs, Zhao Ning Kui from Alibaba, and Charlie Hawk from BlueSpec. Uh, on the board today. Both uh, Rob and Charlie served with me as board members on the RISC-V Foundation board. Uh, so plenty of good quality experience there. And during my talk on Tuesday, uh, Rob stood up and presented this slide as to why this is important to NXP. So that's, again, by way of background of what the Open Hardware Group's about. And you can go to our site. We, like I said, we launched the organization last Thursday. We have plenty more testimonials there uh, from Patterson and, and from Callista and different folks. So we've, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting, uh, it's a very interesting initiative. Great. What's the problem? What problem are we trying to address here? So this is an, a, a, nice, a nice development chart that comes out of a blog post uh, on ARM's ecosystem blog uh, that you can we can debate whether the percentages are right or, or not. The absolute value of the numbers is not important. The relative size of the, and shape of the pie pieces is what's important. And it, certainly close to 90% through software, physical design, verification, and the actual RTL design itself, close to 90% of the effort, development effort and resources are spent on a new IP block. And for things that are highly differentiated, that might make sense. For things that are almost table stakes for uh, any particular design, across the industry, that is just wasted effort. Um, the value um, you know, of, of that IP is, 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 certainly, is certainly good. You have to have it in order to, for, to have a product, um, but it's not necessarily differentiating IP. And this is, a, this is both a good news story and a bad news story. It might sound funny as the original uh, director behind the RISC-V Foundation. Clearly, the availability of an open source ISA has a, really unleashed a new frontier for processor design. In fact, arguably, it's the most exciting thing that's happened in the CPU space in the last decade. Uh, for the most part, we've been building CPUs with the exact same architecture We've been lazy, we've been relying on Moore's Law to drive more performance, and hallelujah, you know, shrink and boom, it goes faster. 
Architecturally, they all look the same-ish. I mean, I'm not trying to offend anybody, but nothing radical has happened, right? The, an, open, an open ISA, a free and open and accessible ISA, means that uh, Avi and I could start a new processor company in his kitchen tomorrow, right? We don't have to talk to anybody. We, we just go get the specs, we start doing our own designs, and away we go, right? So that level, that degree of freedom and innovation, that's very, very attractive, and that's a good thing. How many cores do we need? If you think about the, the availability, the ecosystem availability of all the talent that we have on the planet to support and enable new processors, who cares what the architecture is, whether it's RISC V or x86 or ARM, and, and we, we don't have to debate the size of it, but we can agree that the, it's finite. There is a limited amount of resources around the globe to do the OS porting, tool chain development, all that. The more, the more different architectures we throw in there, that's challenging. The more cores of the same architecture we throw in there, that's challenging. We're just dividing up what is already a finite resource. So if what we're really trying to do is enable mass use and scale around open platforms, the more open platforms we have, the worse it'll be might sound counterintuitive. How many is too many? I mean, yeah, more is, more is good, but will they all get enabled? Will they all get enough critical mass behind them to be accessible? This is a, this is a fun slide, and uh, this is a page that, we, that I used to maintain on the, on the MIS5.org site. And every, every week we'd add not, maybe not every week, but it, you know, quite frequently we'd add new, 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 new repos. And I know of at least another half dozen or, or dozen more that are on the way, stuff that's being worked on, and hey, I think I'm going to open source my core. That's great. How many is the, is the right amount? Should it be half of this? Should it be twice as many of this? Clearly not all of these cores. Now, let's go back to the last question I asked. How many of you have released that are used IP, open source IP in a high volume production SOC, right? All the hands went down. Now, small sample size, but if we're really going to have an impact on the industry and have something that looks the way Linux looks in the server space, we've got to change the way that we operate. We've got to change the way that we collaborate and, and share and make things accessible. I'm not commenting at all about the quality of the course, that's not the point. It's not, a, it's not a question of technical merit, right? These are all good, I'm very sure about it. And some might be better than others. The, the, the point is how do we leverage collaboration? So let's talk about some of the barriers. Uh, let's say I work at a major SOC company, right? And at some point, I'm gonna come into my boss's office I'm going to take my employee badge, and I'm going to put it on the table and say, OK, boss, I'm betting my badge on this core that I just downloaded off some repo by some guy. We're going to put that in our next high volume SOC. Now, how do you like me now, right? I mean, that just does not happen. The verification, hey, you know, oh, it's a university project. They did a good job, but it's not verified very well. So maybe, maybe we won't, won't really be able to use that. There's a number of issues around open IP and how do we, how do we convert those IP blocks. I broke my, there we go. How, we, how do we convert those IP blocks into something that looks like, smells like what you'd expect to get from a, a commercial IP company? Let's assume you get past that. Okay, that's, a, that's a sort of a one trick pony, right? It's a, here's a core that's clearly not part of a product family, not part of a, an evolution for feature enhancements or you know, next year, the second generation of that, more performance, whatever. The ecosystem around that from a roadmap standpoint and the IDE tools and software porting, how, do, how on earth am I going to convince an SOC um, product group to, to use that core without this? Even if we solve all those technical problems, the licensing issue is a significant one. Getting 
the legal and business team of these organizations pass the fact of how they're going to use and share and benefit from this IP, what they have to give back, what, what they don't have to give back, and so on is, is very important. Right? Permissive licensing, I can tell you, is an absolute must if we expect to get commercial support out of large semiconductor companies. So, as I said earlier, what we've done, uh, working with Luca and Frank and the team here at ETH, is uh, this will be the home where the Ariane and risk, Risky Cores, uh, you know, uh, leave school, <laughs> if you will, and, and grow up and graduate into, uh, into production-based, uh, you know, commercial-grade IP. Um, and the collection of companies that we have at the table now, uh, have uh, product commitments that they want to make around the risky core. So the verification that you would expect to see around a commercially supported IP core uh, will be in place, uh, as well as a roadmap for extending these. And that, this is probably the last slide I'm going to throw up for the discussion, because then we'll have more discussion in the, uh, the Q&A later, or in the panel. You know, fundamentally, and there'll be other groups like this, and, and, and that's good, right? But fundamentally, what we need, in my opinion, uh, what we need in the industry uh, is truly commercially uh, supported, if you will, uh, and enabled IP that looks like and feels like the IP that you would expect to get out of, um, you know, out, out, of a, out of a traditional IP vendor in order for this to be adopted. And, you know, the, 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 uh, the licensing aspect, I think, is important. The work that Andrew gave a talk this morning uh, around uh, the work at the open hardware, or sorry, at the, um, at the open, the CERN open hardware license uh, efforts that they're, that, we're, that they're working on um, with, with a permissive version, uh, which I think is, as I said earlier, is required. If, you, if we expect these larger semiconductor companies to participate and adopt this IP, they're going to take it, use it, modify it, and add their own secret sauce to it. That secret sauce that gets added is not, cannot be expected to get uh, added back into the community. They'll commit other things, and that's fine, um, if, if we expect them to participate. So with that, I'm going to stop with the slide content. I can probably take a few questions now, or do you want me to wait for the panel? Okay. Any any questions? We can do a few now apparently. Rick, uh, uh, thank you very much and uh, nice to see my company's name up there on the initial uh, sponsors. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay, um, I think one thing is on the licensing, I think one aspect of, I wasn't in Andrew's talk, but I've got a good idea what he probably spoke about, is not just getting the licensing right, but actually getting the metadata for the licensing right, because certainly experience on the software is not just having the licensing right, but demonstrably being able to show that the licensing is right, licensing is right yep. and that what you have built is related to what you actually had as source code. So I encourage you down that direction. I agree. That was a, more of a statement than a question, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, Rick, thanks, thanks for the talk. I, I have a question about licensing. Um, the last time we uh, examined the question of LGPL and GPL applicability to HCL in Orconf uh, a few years ago, we concluded that LGPL looked very much like GPL in an HCL context, that it was not very clear where the boundaries were, etc. cetera. And in, uh, at CERN with Andrew and with Miriam, we have tried now to do a weak uh, reciprocal license that is really very clear on the boundaries. Now, in your opinion, what would be the objections uh, of these commercial companies against uh, a weak reciprocal licensing scheme? Uh, you said that they would add their secret sauce and that they would not want to release that, but that seems to be, a, to me, a bit in contradiction with what you said in the beginning, that these are cores that everybody needs and they are common components, and you don't want to replicate this. So wouldn't weak copyleft or weak reciprocal be an acceptable good compromise? Or what, what's the objections? 
Uh, that's a good question, Javier. So, um, short answer is no. <laughs> Wouldn't be a good, just based on my experience and the feedback that I get, right? So, some, so as, as in, in a processor core and an SOC and the way that it will get used. In some instances, the cores, for instance, that we will have in the Core 5 family will get used exactly as is. They won't do anything to it. There'll be some other things sitting in the other part of the SOC that you know, bring the extra value of the SOC. Um, and so there you could, you could make an argument that, a, that a, you know, a weak reciprocal license could be okay. But in order for that IP to have extended value inside that SOC company, there'll be instances where they want to take it apart, add something else to it that they don't want to give back. So under that circumstance, they won't want to use it at all in the first place. And you know, we've got some good SOC, you know, large NXP, Silicon Labs, and there's, there's more coming, they're just not ready to announce yet, uh, companies at the table. And the only reason they're, they're even interested in considering is because it's completely permissive. They'll still contribute back. Um, I can't, I think it was uh, Alex during his talk, the, the place to reinforce contribution back into the open source community is in the engagement model, not in the licensing, right? We have to make the, uh, the work that the community is doing economically attractive for those organizations to participate and not use a licensing legislative club to make them participate, because it, it will not work. That's my opinion. Uh, hi, Rick. Uh, so I think this is a really good uh, effort. We need to see more commercial activity, more weight behind uh, this. And it's good to have these, all these companies coming on board. We've been wanting for this a long time. But as a very smart man once said, the CPU is only as good as the software and ecosystem. Uh, and I was wondering, you talk about, a lot about the risk now, but are you also looking at the supporting course infrastructure bus interconnects uh, other ip cores um okay yeah so the, you're talking about the purview overall of the open hardware group uh, yeah so th we're very focused on the core and closely related processor subsystem so interconnect um memory memory subsystem and so on yes but not not in, uh, out into the uncore, if you will, right? The peripheral uh, other side of the SOC, and certainly not the SOC. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.